Good afternoon to everybody who is um, has joined us for the uh, this report on Australia's progress towards hepatitis C elimination. Thank you very much for for joining us today. This is, I think, the the fourth report that we've we've put out, which is a collaboration between the Burnett Institute and the Kirby Institute, but with many, many, many other partners who contribute data. Um, my name's Margaret Hellard. Um, I'm a deputy director at the Burnett Institute and been involved in hepatitis C elimination efforts for some time, along with many other people on this call. And we thank you all for your ongoing effort. Can I have the next slide, please? Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which this report was produced, including the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nations, where the Burnett Institute uh, is located, and the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, where the Kirby Institute is located, but also recognising that many, many other um, people have contributed data from across different um, um, nations and, and lands as well. We pay respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and recognise their cultural, spiritual and educational practices their ongoing connections to lands, water, and communities, and that sovereignty has never been ceded. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to do a recognition of and acknowledge all of the people that have lost their lives to hepatitis C and liver disease over the years. Um, and as well for, for in Australia, the group that um, you know, highest risk of, of um, hepatitis C is people who inject drugs and drug overdose and the the laws that we have around that are, are not appropriate at all and should be changed. We acknowledge and thank the people with lived experience of hepatitis C who have generously participated in research and their contribution to the progress towards hepatitis C elimination. This is real people and real lives that give meaning to the work that we are, are all trying to do. And, and it, is, um, it is those people that are central to this. Next slide. People know I love housekeeping. So um, basically we're gonna be Anna Wilkinson, who um, helps, who really leads the preparation of this report every year, um, will be providing highlights from the report, and then we'll be followed by Q and A, um, which will be uh, run by Elisa Padrana. Um, there's things, if you like, into the, the frame of tweeting and hashtagging and doing all sorts of things, and also uh, you can find out that's where you can contact us if you've got uh, any questions as well. Please feel free to contact us. Next slide, please. The panellists will comprise of um, a number of people, myself, um, Greg Dorr, who's Program Head of Viral Hepatitis Clinical Research Programs at the Kirby Institute, Carrie Fowley, who's CEO of Hepatitis Australia, Rebecca Winter, representing the National Hepatitis Network, sorry, National Prisons Hepatitis Network at St Vincent's Hospital and the Burnett Institute, um, James Ward from the Post Centre for Indigenous Health, University of Queensland, Tiony Crawford, CEO of Harm Reduction Victoria, Sinead Shields, um, from uh, Royal Alfred, sorry, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, Australasian Hepatology Association Board and past president, and um, giving a really strong voice about nurses and nurse practitioners, and Alyssa Pradrana, who is the coordinator of EC Australia in the, at the Burnett Institute. Uh, next slide, please. I think it's really just to say, um, I'm going to hand over to Anna because I don't want to spend too much long, but, uh, long on this, but really just want to say um, publicly a big thank you to Anna, Mark, and all of the team for the work. So thank you. And over to you, Anna. Thank you, Margaret. Welcome everybody and good afternoon. Thank you for coming along today. My name is Anna Wilkinson. I'm gonna present first some thank yous and then some data highlights. And I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people today. I'd also like to acknowledge Mark Hayes who has co-produced this year's report with me. We have the, a breadth of editors that come from across a couple of different institutes, but this the report, as Margaret said, is a partnership between the Kirby Institute and the Burnett Institute. So I'd like to thank the editors who make enormous contribution each year to make sure the report comes together. The report comes together only because people share their data with us voluntarily, which is lovely, tell us about their data and then they hand their data over. So it's a collation exercise. So I would like to go through and make sure we properly acknowledge and thank the projects, but also the people behind these projects. They put an enormous amount of work into communicating with us, explaining their data and sharing their data. So I will be going through some names, but I don't, at risk of leaving people out, I still would like to balance off acknowledging some people and naming some people, but I know that they come from teams and projects behind them. So I'd like to start by acknowledging Jason Aslan and Michael Traeger from the Access Project, Claire Bradley from the Atlas Sexual Surveillance Network, Jenny Iverson from the Australian Needle Syringe Program Survey, Bezard and Greg from the Monitoring Treatment Uptake Project, Joanne Carson from the National Retreatment Project, 
Yumi Sheehan and Rebecca Winter, who's on our panel today from the National Prisons Hepatitis Network, Mandy Byrne from the Australian and New Zealand Liver Intestinal Transplant Registry, Jess Howell, who provided data and additional analysis of the transplant registry data, Tim Brody from the Stigma Ind Indicators Monitoring Project, Heather Valerio and Jason Grebley from the Ethos Engage Project, Daniel O'Keefe and Jack Gunn from the EC Experience Cohort, Martin Holt, Lee Min Mayo and Tim Brody again from the Gay Community Periodic Survey, Jen McLaughlin and Ben Cowie from the Viral Hepatitis Modelling Project, Nick Scott and Anna Palmer from the Burnett Institute Viral Hepatitis Working Group for modelling work. Thank you to everyone who's provided an enormous amount of time to make sure the report has a depth and breadth of data from across the sector. All right, folks, we're gonna whiz through some data highlights. So everything I present today is available in the report. We're going to select a little bit of data from each of the chapters. It really is only a small proportion and not choosing favorites. I just wanna choose out a few things you might be interested in to show you what we've got and also to inform our discussion in the Q&A. It's lots of figures, but it's no equations, not anything really difficult. It's really to give you a taster, but more importantly, it's to really start to think about what you might like to discuss in our Q&A panel. So we have lots of time for Q&A afterwards. So please start thinking about your questions now, but as you look at the data, also think about your questions and Mark Hayes and Elisa Pedrana are gonna help us out with Q&A. Okay, we're gonna start off with chapter one, which is uh, looking at new infections. So measuring new infections of hepatitis C can actually be quite a challenging task for us. We have access data and we do use this to measure an incidence rate, which tells us about the speed of new infections. And we use access because it follows patients over time. So we can get an incidence rate from access data. So data here are presented from patients who attended a primary care clinic in the access network. These clinics do provide general health services, but they also provide specialist health services to people at risk of hepatitis C, such as a co-located needle and syringe program or opiate agonist therapy prescribers. So they are a nice uh, set of sites to think about monitoring hepatitis C infections. We do know the incidence rate. So on that left-hand side, it's about 1.5. That's lower than we do see in other cohorts. But the key message to take away here is the trend, which halves. So we can see from 2016, when we know we had unrestricted access to direct acting antivirals, and I'll say DAAs, we have that halving. So this confirms what we thought would happen in that if we treat people, we prevent new infections. This is a very good news story, which is what we wanna take away from some of our incidence estimates. We go on to chapter two, which is testing. We always need to think about things like measures of new infections in the context of, well, how many tests were done and who was tested. So here we again have data from access, and these are the same primary care clinics as the measures before. The dark bars are antibody, hepatitis C antibody tests among men, so it's number of men. The light pink bars are the number of women who received a hepatitis C antibody test. It only counts one person per year. So this is direct counts of individuals who have been hepatitis C antibody tested. We can see that in 2021 and 2020, 2020 and 2021, we had fewer tests among men. This is likely to be a drop off related to COVID related restrictions, impeding some access to healthcare because a lot of these clinics were based in Victoria and we did have the longer lockdowns in 2020 and 2021. There is less of a drop among women. This does point towards something we've been working on in the access data, which is we think some hepatitis C testing is antenatal related testing. So like a universal screening rather than a risk-based screening. So the testing didn't drop off as much among women. We have a piece of work in the future to try and separate out these tests. So we understand the hepatitis C antibody testing a bit more. The lines you see here are bluish lines are our positivity. So we can see that among women, that solid line down the bottom, we have a positivity at 2021 of about 5%. You can clearly see in the dotted line, it's much higher among men. So it's about 25%. So one in four men who received hepatitis C antibody test at these clinics in 2021 were positive. So despite the drop off in testing, we still have the men coming in who were tested were positive, which tells us that at these clinics, they are seeing people at risk of hepatitis C. It's an important activity for them but we do see that lower positivity among women. We have data from the ATLAS Sexual Health Surveillance Network. ATLAS has 34 Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services currently in the network. It, it is always expanding. So it does give us a nice breadth of data among this particular type of service. 
We have a cascade, which is always a nice way of thinking about the data when we can kind of see people moving through those steps of testing towards a complete diagnosis. This is aggregated data, so all data from 2016 to 2021. It's over 136,000 individuals included in this analysis. Of these patients, we can see about one in five received a hepatitis C antibody test. Now testing out these service is not universal, it's risk-based, it's not designed to test everybody. Of those tested, about 6% were positive. Of those who had some antibody positivity, just over half then received that RNA test, which is really vital. So it's great that about half were tested, a little bit of room to go, but we do have excellent uptake of RNA testing. And of those tested for RNA, about half were positive. This is publicly available data, which is Medicare claims for hepatitis C RNA testing for new infections only. We restrict it to a very specific item numbers to think about what's happening in new infections. We've seen this data before. Unfortunately, it does show we have this declining trend in RNA testing from about 2017. It's really plateaued across 2020 and 2021. So not that big drop off we saw in access data, probably because it's national rather than very um, heavily state based. But we can see there is no pickup from that declines in testing that we have seen since that introduction of DAs in 2016. Moving on to our uptake of treatment chapter. This is a very popular monitoring treatment uptake project, which uses PBS data. You would be familiar with this figure and it shows what is commonly termed our waterfall effect or our real decline in the uptake of treatment since 2016. So we can see it continues to decline in the, this is quarterly data. So our last four bars are 2021. And we know there's about six and a half thousand people who were treated in 20. 2021 in total. We can see some very nice things happening though. If you look towards our lighter pink bars, we can see our nurse practitioners coming into this data. So we're starting to understand who is doing some of that treatment, starting to identify practitioners better in the data, and we can start to track some of that data coming through with nurse practitioners treating people. We have three years of data now from our National Prisons Hepatitis Network on DAA treatment commenced in prisons across the, um, across the nas nationally, across all jurisdictions. So in 2021, just over 2,600 people initiated treatment in prison that was recorded, collated and provided to us by the um, National Prisons Hepatitis Network. So we can compare our prison-based treatment to our community-based treatment, and we can come up with a relative figure, which tells us that about just over 40% of all the treatment in, the, in 2021 was initiated in prisons. So we have to remember that this proportion has gone up this year, but the treatment in community has gone down. However, the good thing is I think to take from this is that prisons have maintained their effort to offer access to treatment. We have some new data this year on people being retreated. The National Retreatment Project used the PBS data, but PBS doesn't record a reason for retreatment. So the project used a cohort you may be familiar with, which is the REACH-C cohort, and it took information from REACH-C to try and understand the PBS data and classify people as retreated for reinfection or treatment failure. So the project used approximately the 95,000 people between 2016 and 2021 who received DAA treatment and about 7% of those people were estimated to be retreated. I've just shown one figure here, which is the retreatment for reinfection. We can see that pickup in retreatment for reinfection. It has stabilized in the recent years, perhaps a little bit of a decline down, likely related to those declines we see in treatment uptake overall. So Understandably, if people aren't being treated for the first time, they're not being retreated. Um, but it's interesting to start seeing um, that delineation between treatment failure and reinfection and start to understand some of our retreatment rates. We're familiar with diagnosis and care cascades. They're really helpful again, like with the Atlas data for showing how people are stepping through some of these care points that we need them to move through to achieve cure. So we have data from Access Primary Care Clinics. These are the same clinics that I showed previously. And we can construct a cascade because access data is longitudinal data. It links people over time. So it's very helpful for creating these cohorts of patients. We've aggregated data from 2016 to 2021. We can see here that of the people ever diagnosed RNA positive, 
who had then her viral load, who had a viral load and genotype. The important thing I always take away from access is the initiated treatment. And we have just over 50% treatment coverage or people who initiated treatment. So I think it's interesting to think about this cascade, the Atlas cascade and our national cascades to think about where we are in treatment coverage and access is telling us about half of the patients we were able to put in this cohort when we construct this study were treated. So again, a little bit of a ways to go in bumping up perhaps that treatment uptake. This is the ATLAS sexual surveillance network. Again, I like um, putting ATLAS and access data together. We can come up with some of these same constructions of data, which is sometimes helpful. They don't always have to be compared, but it's nice to think about how we can see the differences or the similarities between the data sets. So of the individuals who were ever hepatitis C RNA tested, we have about one in five ever prescribed DAAs. I think it's important always to think about ATLAS because it is a sexual surveillance network is to not take away a, a bad news story all the time. I know the ATLAS team, similar to what we do in Access, is always thinking about things such as, well, it may be that people were um, had the RNA positivity, but they were treated in another clinic. So at the moment, it might be one in five, but I know the ATLAS team is thinking about perhaps people were treated elsewhere, perhaps there's some um, data processing that they need to think through to make sure they've got all the treatment data before we can fully understand what's, what is happening in the services to then think about service improvement or quality improvement of care. We have our chapter on our longer term outcomes of hepatitis C, which I know people are always keen to think about, particularly now because we are moving through treating so many people, we are starting to think about what is the additional care that they need after treatment. It's still a little bit of a challenge to get some of these longer term outcomes and data on longer term of these data on these longer term outcomes. We have our data from the transplant registry, which is always helpful. What we want to look at is that dark red down the bottom there. This is hepatitis C cirrhosis related transplants and we can see that decline which is always nice. So even though I think that's coming through quite quickly given DA unrestricted access to DAs is 2016, we can see 2019, 2020, 2021 some declines in hepatitis C cirrhosis related transplants which is a positive thing. That's what we wanted to do with DAs was turn around some of those trends. Jess Howell and colleagues then did further investigation of some of the transplant data, which is always helpful. So the, the plot that I showed previously was when a person had has a primary diagnosis, so that only looks at primary diagnosis, the transplant registry actually has up to four diagnoses attached to a person's transplant. So Jess Howell and her colleagues looked at any hepatitis C related transplant, so whether it was one through to four um, as a diagnosis for that person. What we can see, we're looking for that dark pink line up near the dotted line, so the second line from the top. We can see hepatitis C related transplants had an increasing trend over time with then some stabilization again in those more recent years. The data only goes up to 2019 so far, but hopefully with some, um, if we look at this again in that future, that very sort of indication, slight indication of a downward trend, hopefully should keep going and we start to make an impact on some of these longer term outcomes with increasing access to treatment. Importantly, our report has always had a chapter on stigma and discrimination experienced by people living with hepatitis C and people who inject drugs. As I always remind people at this point, it's good to think about the data we've seen on things like new infections, uptake of treatment, uptake of testing in the context of of the experiences people are having in relation to stigma and discrimination. The stigma indicating indicator monitoring project surveys people living with hepatitis C and people who inject drugs, what we can see here. So if we're looking at the dark starting from the dark pink bars, we don't really see a change over time in the people who have had some sort of experience of stigma and discrimination. So we would have liked to have seen those gray bars come down in time, and they've, they've not changed at all. This is hepatitis C related stigma. We also have injecting drug use related stigma. And again, we would have hoped to see those gray bars 2018 and 2021 come down a little bit to, that were making a dent in some of the experience of stigma. However, people are st still reporting that they have these experiences. 
We've put some additional notes in the report this year, which I think is really helpful to think about this and this data and how it's presented and what it might mean. And we do make a note that perhaps we need to think about this lack of change in the context of what has been done that could have made an improvement. So we need to think about whether or not we've um, put some investment and some focused interventions in, in reducing stigma or whether or not the change that we don't see is because there hasn't been that investment or hasn't been those focused interventions that could have caused a positive change. Importantly, we always continue to focus on primary prevention and hence we always have a chapter aside for primary prevention in the report. This is the Australian needle syringe program survey which asks people about their experiences of re reusing someone else's needles and syringes in the past month. We can see it pleasingly it's generally a small proportion. That red bar which is none is the majority of the, the reports which is always nice to see. However we perhaps could think about whether or not we do want this to actually change and whether or not we really want to get very very low proportions of people reporting reuse. I think I think in 2021, we can perhaps see that there was a bit more than the other years. And again, this might be related to um, COVID-19 related pandemic restrictions impeding some people's access to healthcare. For our chapter on equity, um, I'll just remind folks that we're almost there. You've almost made it through all the data. So start thinking about your questions and the fun part, which is the Q&A. But for our chapter on equity, we have data from the Viral Hepatitis Mapping Project. So this project had delays in their data this year, which is outside their control, but we still really wanted to make sure we um, highlight the issue of equity and particularly geographical inequity in relation to treatment uptake. So we have the data until the end of December 2020. What we can see, well, there's a range of colours, which means there's a range of treatment uptake across Australia, from the very good in the red to the less so good in the pink. It's always interesting though to think about, and Margaret spoke about this last year as well, was that despite the fact that this might highlight areas where we need to improve, we can also think about, well, this map shows us who should we go and ask for what they did well and what did they do? So if you've got areas in the dark pink with high treatment uptake, we need to think about, well, what lessons can we take from those areas and apply them to those that need some increasing treatment uptake? All right, folks, here's the fun part where every year I try and explain Nick Scott's modeling. Let's go. So Nick Scott and his group at the Burnett Institute uh, modelled what would happen if we gave people uh, incentives to retain them in the testing and treatment cascade. So the modelling used data measured by the EC testing campaign on retention and care. So returning for testing and getting a complete testing episode. So just as a reminder, what we're talking about when we say complete testing is that someone has the diagnosis that they need. So if they're antibody negative, they know that. If they're antibody positive, they have an RNA test and then they have the result of that RNA test. So they have a comprehensive set of testing that tells them where they're at with their hepatitis C. So in the testing campaign study, just over 60% of people had a complete testing episode. If a $500 incentive was provided and it bumped that up to 74%, so we improved the cascade, the average cost of testing per person would be the same for that service. So the money they spent on the incentive to retain a person would actually be the same as if they spent more money going out to look for new people or um, to replace the people they lost. So the cost is the same. For treatment in the testing campaign study, 67% of people were treated if a $200 incentive was used and we bumped that up to 83%, so we kept 83% of people in the cascade, the cost per person is the same. So again, it's very expensive to continually lose people from the cascade and find new people for testing and treatment. If instead we spent that money on reimbursing them for their time and keeping them in the cascade and retaining them, the cost is the same. In the settings then, where there is high loss to follow up, financial incentives are actually even more, val even more value. So we have some data here to show what I think is the question people have been asking is, which is how much can you give? And actually it might be a bit higher than what you actually realised. But the important thing is it has an economical benefit. 
it might sound like large amounts of money, but actually it's not because the large amounts of money are going out and finding new people and trying to re trying to replace the ones you've lost. You're actually better off spending your money on keeping people once you have them. Okay, I am now going to say thank you for listening to the data. You got through the data part, now you get to do the fun thing. I'm going to invite our panel guests to turn their cameras on to join our Q&A. And I'm going to hand over to our Q&A host, which is Elisa Pedrana. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Anna. Fantastic slides. Um, so we are opening up our session now to the Q&A panel. And I've got all the panelists online. Um, there are a few questions in the Q&A box, so please keep typing them in and we'll endeavour to answer all of them. Um, if not live, Mark is also available to be typing in questions. So the first question um, is really a more general one, and this will be going out to Margaret and Greg. We are seeing continued declines in testing and treatment overall, um, but we do have some good news stories, including increasing testing amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. What are the settings and or populations do we need to be focusing on over the next five to seven years? Let's throw to Margaret first. Then we'll go to Greg and then we can just swing around to James. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. I think there are settings where people, where, where, where I still think there are settings that we can be really focusing on capturing people um, where there are high proportions of people with hepatitis C infection. As, as Anna's data showed, that even in high caseload clinics where there's needle and syringe programs and, um, and opiate substitution therapy programs, and there's some other data that people will see in the report where we looked at people on opiate substitution therapy. We're still not getting that group of people tested or having a full test event and then on to treatment. So I, I think that number one, there are those places where we can still be doing a better job of um, bringing them into care. I think there's some other places as well um, that we can be looking at where people who, um, again, have high proportion, high likelihood of being infected. So that's at pharmacies. I think there's community corrections. So in line with the prison system, where we know that a significant proportion of people are being incarcerated, in my view, it's the wrong way to be managing um, things to keep on incarcerating people, but I acknowledge that that's what happens, so we need to continue that work, but a significant proportion are actually on community correction orders. So there's a number of places, mental health services, again, where there's over-representation. So there are many places where I think we can still be really working harder to help provide a cascade or a care program that works for those individuals as well, and I'm sure I'll let James speak to it, in fact, in terms of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, communities and, and ways that we can do far better there as well. But th they're my thoughts. Thanks, Margaret. Greg, do you have anything to add? Yeah, look, I think a couple of things. Um, I think there's two sort of different strategies in a way. Um, we know the very high prevalent populations and um, Margaret's articulated those. Um, and I think there's a need for some of those settings to have intensive screening programs and linkage to care. And exactly how often we do those intensive screening strategies, I think we need to work through. So, for example, in the prison setting, do you do that every 12 months or maybe even every six months in a setting where you're really trying to get the level of virus down to low levels? So that's one aspect of testing. Then there, there are some groups where you know we aren't doing as well as we should be. And I think for example, some of the culturally and linguistically diverse communities, we've been looking a bit more detail at this in our linkage work. Um, and there clearly are some gaps there, and we've got some more information coming through about specific subpopulations, specific countries of birth and ethnicity-based populations that I think we really do need to focus on in terms of messaging and, and enhanced testing and awareness. Thanks, Greg. I'm going to look over to you, James. Um, Anna didn't present all the data here around hepatitis C testing amongst in Aboriginal community controlled organisations, but we are seeing an increase in both antibody and RNA testing. Can you tell us about if we're seeing this increase in both urban and rural areas, as well as if it's translating into treatment uptake within the Atlas network? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. And while Eliminate C has still got a long way to go to impact uh, the whole population. I think there's some real gaps uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. <clears throat> uh, we've got uh, uh, an increasing gap in infection, uh, in incident infections in the Australian population between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. 
uh, we have reinfection rates are much higher among Aboriginal people. And I don't think the treatment uh, benefits, uh, um, the, the benefits of treatment as prevention um, because of DAAs are being seen enough in our population. And so what I think uh, how we need to move forward is really put an equity lens on this from the way, uh, from right now and put a real equity. And I'm not talking about uh, equality, I'm talking equity. And why we need equity is because we, um, we can roll out programs in mainstream services or in Aboriginal medical services, but if we don't put an extra level on of um, potency on these interventions, then we're not going to we're not going to win this race. And so, um, that's not an even playing field. The social determinants are much more inequitable, um, and you have things like stigma and racism occurring. Um, uh, to, to, together and it's a myriad of stigma that uh, intersects across race and place um, using being hep C positive and perhaps mental health and social emotional well-being issues so I think um, we really need to think about the model of care um, obviously Aboriginal medical services are one aspect but I do think um, uh, mainstream services have got to really um, uh, pull, pull along in this race as well. Um, it might be useful for ECA to consider into the future the four pillars of um, structural reform under the new Closing the Gap Agreement. Um, they are about shared decision-making, um, strengthening the Aboriginal community-controlled health sector, which I think is showing some good information now, but data transformation and really precision data, I think, is what's required. And importantly, making the mainstream services do better for us. And so I think um, I'll leave it there for the now, but there's plenty more to be talked about. Yep. That's great. Thanks, James. Um, I do want to pick up on models of care, and I'm going to invite Sione and Carrie um, to respond to this. What are the sort of types of models that we need to be focusing on to ensure that we are increasing access to both testing and treatment to these populations that Margaret, Greg and James just covered? Sione, do you want to go first? Sure. I was just about to point and carry to start. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for the, thanks for the um, for the slides and the um, and the presentation as well. It's really uh, interesting. Um, so I, I guess just to pick up on what uh, James just said, actually, I think um, uh, it's it's something that we've been thinking about uh, a lot recently. Uh, in terms of mainstream organisations who um, need to pick up the slack around Aboriginal people as well, and I think that um, uh, I think that it's really incumbent on main on, on organisations, including you know uh, peer based ones as well, to really start uh, thinking much more about how to I guess for want of a better word decolonise our practice, which is uh, so deeply embedded, and we think about how deeply embedded stigma and discrimination around injecting drug use is. Um, and as James just said, that sort of is magnified. We talk about Aboriginal people, and I think that um, I think that uh, like we need to. Uh, I think that in terms of like defining what kind of a model of care works for any given sort of area, um, service, or location, I think that we just have to really fall back on um, really good community consultation and being really aware of our own um, being really aware of our own. Um, uh, uh, I suppose our own internal stigma and our own the, the way that we um, think about our services and really question ourselves about whether or not we really are actually a hard to reach service or whether or not um, we've got a hard to reach population or a hard to reach service and I think oftentimes the answer would be that we've got a hard to reach service for in a number of different ways. Uh, I think the other thing that I took from um, the presentation is that um, uh, incentives Incentives are clearly, I think we've got some information now that incentives are uh, have an economic benefit. Um, they're not just a drain. And I think that nearly always the conversation about incentives is how to afford them. And I think we've just sort of seen that actually, uh, if we think about it in a more holistic way, um, they actually will save money. And so how do we, so I think that to, to be really honest, for some particular populations especially, but I mean, maybe there's a, a, a rationale for doing it just more broadly, I don't know. But I think that, um, really kind of including incentives as part of our models of care where possible, um, as, as often as possible, um, is a really important way forward. People who, you know, the community organisations, um, peer leader organisations that have been involved in this work for, the, for a number of years have sort of been talking about this for a long time because uh, we know that it's just um, really, diff it can be really tricky to make 
uh, HEPs a priority when you know, you've got all the other multiple day-to-day -day priorities that uh, you need to uh, prioritize when you're when you're using. And um, I guess the last thing I'd say is that I'd, um, I did a talk for um, statewide hepatitis um, programs study day to day, and we, I I reflected on my own experiences um, uh, of diagnosis for Hep C and of treatment for Hep C, and um, pretty much my entire journey with Hep C was um, was uh, alongside nurses. And I think that um, nurse led and and I mean I think we've we've seen this and we've talked about it, but I think nurse nurse and peer led uh, um, programs are um, are still clearly a really important way forwards and figuring out the exact configuration of that for different jurisdictions can be tricky but i think that uh i, th I think that um nurses and peers make great partners thank you sioni carrie do you want to add to those around um, the particular types of models of care that we think we need to be focusing on supporting and financing um thanks for that hi everyone and congratulations on the report um, I guess just pivoting off of a couple of things that both James and Sione have said, I'm thoughtful of the collaborative work that was done to um, look at the new targets for the new strategy and how there's a particular equity lens that's been taken on that, that going forward, um, equity needs to be front and centre of the entire response and that um, we won't meet any of the targets unless um, they're met for all. And what that particularly means, I guess, um, thinking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So hopefully that um, uh, shift uh, will really help. I'm also, I guess, thoughtful of the upcoming uh, refresh of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander BBVSTI strategy and the, the bringing in and the strengthening of um, the ARCHOs, but also the importance of making sure the rest of the response um, doesn't get off the hook uh, in terms of the work that they're doing. Um, I guess in terms of other types of models, uh, a lot of it's about the future is decentralization and community and peer-led. Um, I'm thoughtful of, say, for example, the ECA presentations that were done last week. You know, that was a really wonderful um, showcase of community work in the response. But I'm also really thoughtful of how um, we're hearing announcements of say, for example, research funding in the space, which is really great, but it's critically important that also the community is resourced to be able to do the work and that we don't take for granted the community infrastructure that's there, that the entire response is reliant on to be able to do all of the work that happens. And that includes costing things properly, I guess, building on Sione's comments about incentives that there's needs to just be costed into the work of doing day-to-day um, -day business. Um, I guess also I would just like to flag as well um, uh, and take this moment to congratulate Avel on the event at uh, the Stigma Conference at Parliament House yesterday, which was a really fantastic but really critical reminder about how stigma is driving so much of the challenges um, in this um, space. And I know one of the conversations, and this relates to models of care, was about consent. And across all models, as we get more and more pressure to increase, for example, testing numbers, that we don't drop off quality and that we make sure informed consent um, drives the work that we're doing, regardless of how we might innovate, that we don't drop off um, uh, quality in that regard. So those are just some thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Kerry. I'm going to flip over to the Q&A um, panel and invite a question from Jacqueline. Um, she asked whether there was any delineation regarding the setting in which the stigma and discrimination indicators were being experienced or reported among. So this is probably a question to you, Anna. Um, are the stigma indicators being reported um, by setting and are there any differences in the setting? I can see Carla is online, so she may want to respond to that question, yeah. but I'll, I'll flick <laughs> over to you, Anna, in case you are able to provide us with any information about that. Yeah, I think Carla or Tim might might want to just make a, a clear answer in the in the Q and A. Um, however, there was previously some data in the last report about uh, healthcare workers and expressions of stigma towards people. So that was very specific. This year's data is about the general community based experience of stigma when they do those surveys. Um, but yeah, it's really important to have a to check in with Carla and Tim and their data is online so it's all referenced 
So the report has these really nice hyperlinks. So you can click on end that data in the report and the reference, and it will take you straight to the stigma indicator monitoring project report. And that has a lot of detail about their project there. But yeah, good question about settings. I agree. And Margaret had the same question for me when we were putting the report together. Um, it's all there. Thanks, Anna. I'm, I'm going to flick over now to Sinead. The, it was fantastic to see the actual contribution of nurse practitioners to our treatment prescribing in this data, uh, in this report, this year's report. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we need to be doing to continue to support nurse practitioners expanding that work? Also, um, so what are the barriers that we face in enhancing nurse-led models um, to deliver hepatitis C testing and treatment? Thanks, Shanae. Okay. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. Um, well, um, it is good to see a little bit of NP data coming into the um, reports. However, um, uh, the NPs are working closely with Kirby and Burnett to get a little bit more clarity on that because um, certainly in New South Wales, we know that the actual prescribing is uh, numbers are higher than what's been um, reflected from the data out of um, from that PBS data. So there is a bit of an inconsistency. So we do feel we are prescribing more. Um, certainly, um, there are, as well as the hepatology NPs, there's all the other NPs working in the areas that are that our um, affected community are, you know, an ID and drug health and mental health and sexual health and prison health and all of those NPs. And there needs to be, um, uh, some of us are, are well endorsed to be doing this as our work and other NPs who are working with our affected communities are not necessarily endorsed to be um, treating hepatitis C within their within their scope of practice. And so because there may be barriers at service level um, or at state level or at national level. Um, in New South Wales, for example, there's very practical barriers like um, I can prescribe hepatitis C treatment to anyone that needs it, but I can't legally order a blood test for them. I have to go running off and say, hey, Professor McCon, can I keep using your blank signed um, blood forms? Um, because legally I can't order a blood test despite being a, a nurse practitioner. So there's lots of legal barriers as well. Um, with regards to nurses um, in general, I think nurses are really have moved to the helm of driving the a lot of the hepatitis um, cascade of care, the hepatitis C. Um, Nick Scott showed um, at the showcase recently, there was at least a dozen interventions that make a difference to the various, uh, to the, various um, uh, the cascade of care. And it was everything from GP education to um, you know, delivering care to um, getting services out there, hang on, where are we? Getting services out to where they need to be, um, contact tracing, um, um, working with, um, being, being able to get, yeah, get the services into the community, uh, providing, uh, developing services that can offer incentives. And that's not always easy. There's a lot of navigating around that. So nurses are, are involved at every level. Um, and and they are the ones driving the services. And I kind of feel like certainly in, in I've spoken to a few other uh, nurses and nurse practitioners, the um, the model seems to be moving more from a medical led model to a, to a nursing led model and a nurse practitioner led model with clearly with our medical colleagues there in the background, but starting to take a bit more of a backseat. Um, and so um, you, you really need us and, um, and we're here and capable and diverse and, um, and need to be involved at every step of the way. Thank you, Sinead. I know there are a number of nurse practitioners within mental health services. There's a question here just around the types of specific mental health services where we are seeing testing and treatment occurring. Are you able to comment or answer this question? Sorry, what, I didn't get what the question is. Are there specific types of mental health services where nurse practitioners oh. are largely based in doing a lot of this work? Um, well, we know that the higher prevalence of hepatitis C is in people with more severe mental health conditions. Um, and so 
MPs working in that space have got potential, you know, are clearly seeing those clients who are at risk of having hepatitis C. So with more education uh, could be, uh, and or with the right brief could be testing and, and treating. Um, I know that is definitely happening in some areas, um, but not widespread across the board. Uh, does that answer the question? And and also the other thing is without the NPs, if there is no um, NPs to be doing the prescribing, the, the mental health nurses of every shape and form can be working closely alongside other prescribers, such as myself or other prescribers that work very closely with their mental health nurses. Does that answer I think the that question? Does. I think it does. I think it's more in the uh, community mental health services rather than oh, the look, and, and inpatient, or, taking yeah. the opportunity when people are inpatients to to get all our screening done so we can see uh, do we commence their treatment while they're in hospital or would it be better off hanging off a week or two and 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 um, deliver it alongside, for example, methadone or a, or a caseworker out in the community who they're more connected with or um, so finding the, the way that's going to have greatest adherence. Yeah. Yep, that's great. Thank you, Sinead. I'm, I'm encouraging people to post a few more questions. We do have another five, seven minutes. There is probably a question for Greg, Margaret and Anna, um, just relation into why some of the areas and the maps are not necessarily seeing that um, the impact of say, uh, well, the impact that people working on the ground are feeling like they are progressing. So sort of that the disconnect between say how people on the ground feel like their, their treatment, testing and treatment numbers are going versus what's actually being represented in the data. Can you make a comment about how um, the data is sort of presented um, in the report? I might take that, Elise. Go, yeah. Um, so there's always limitations in some of the geographical sort of data. Um, the denominators are difficult to get right um, and various sort of uh, strategies are used to try and place people where they are. Um, sometimes you have to use uh, residents of notification and we try and update that with residents of say a more recent hospitalization or more information that we have. Um, but inherently some of the methodology is somewhat limited based on that. That's not to say that there's not disparities. There's definitely going to be geographical disparities as there are across various subpopulations of people with hepatitis C. So I think it gives you some guidance in terms of some areas where there's some clear sort of uh, disparity and, some, and, and that should therefore strategically lead to some enhanced efforts or some enhanced data collection to try and get to the bottom of what's sort of happening in those sort of settings. And as I alluded to before, that's what we're really trying to do at the moment in relation to country of birth. We're trying to sort of look very closely at cascade of care around sort of country of birth. So I think there's, there's a, a need for more nuanced data and to align that data with strategic sort of action. Yeah, it, I think pe people just have to understand that where diagnosis may occur, so it shows up in a mapping report, might be different to where people go and live. And we see this in a lot of populations where there's mobility and then trying to map that. So so I, I'll just agree with Greg in saying, think of it as a guide and think of it as a place to be making sure we're looking for where there is inequity of care and service, but it's not absolute in terms of the numbers. Thanks, Margaret. I do want to invite um, Beck Winter to now um, talk to a little, talk to us a little bit around the data coming in from the prisons into both last year's report and this year's report. Um, what do you see the priorities are for increasing to continue to increase testing and treatment for people in prison? Thanks, Elisa. Um, I'm on unceded land of the Bunurong people here in the inner west, and I really want to, given the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in prisons, I want to acknowledge the negative um, and intergenerational effects on, of imprisonment on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and also um, the negative effects of imprisonment on people who use drugs and support parallel efforts for, um, to advocate for decriminalisation and alternatives to imprisonment. So that said, um, I think in the prison sector, um, the biggest absence really in, is um, in providing uh, harm reduction services 
Um, and this needs to really be um, incorporated into all hepatitis services nationally. Um, second, I think it's really important to celebrate the really stellar work that's um, being undertaken by all the prison hepatitis services in all jurisdictions. Um, it's been maintained at a really amazing level. Um, and I think in practice, implementing health services in prisons is not easy um, and requires constant advocacy. Um, but I think the priorities moving forward are that we really need to explore strategies to um, increase rapid pathways to testing and diagnosis in prisons. And this might include the use of rapid testing technologies and perhaps in conjunction with um, people with lived experience looking at the possibility of opt-out testing policies. Um, I've got a bit of a, a shopping list, really. Um, we could improve efficiencies, such as incorporating reflex testing. Um, we could move towards SVR4, uh, invest in peer-led education and support networks and improve cultural safety of health services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We really need to improve data reporting and surveillance, particularly testing. We don't have uh, testing data for people coming into prisons for most jurisdictions, and we don't know the prevalence of hepatitis C among people coming into prisons. And I know that the National Prisons Hepatitis Network is taking a big step towards getting that with reinvigorating the National Seroprevalence Survey, which is underway at the moment. Um, but that will need to be supported going forward, funded and supported by all jurisdictions. So we have that data. Um, and I also want to yeah, support the shout out for um, nurse led models of care and um, just say what that all, pretty much all of the prison programs are nurse or GP led so you know really broadly talking primary care led. Um, and lastly, I think we really need to stop thinking about prisons in isolation and think about people transitioning in and out. Um, in and out of prison and there are really promising results coming from Queensland with the Quinn Prisons Transition Service and the Community Corrections um, Program, which we should really pay attention to in terms of implementing in other jurisdictions. Thank you, Beck, and thank you for really bringing a focus to the role of prevention. Um, we often get sidetracked and focused wholly on testing and treatment, and it's great that our report has a chapter on prevention and it's a real keen focus um, so thanks for, for making that point really clear. There are a few more questions on the panel, um, the Q&A panel. There's one specifically around uh, routine antenatal testing for hepatitis C and where are we seeing these? Um, and I know you presented this data within the ACCESS network and I know some of this also comes in through the ATLAS network. So I might uh, put this question first to Margaret, Anna and then to James. Margaret first. I was going to say I'm happy for for Anna to take it if she wants to. So so, in terms of of routine antenatal testing, it I think it varies across jurisdictions, but it's increasingly being seen. So that would be what I would say is the first thing. And and I'm just trying to remember whether it's now formally recommended in guidelines or it's got that sort of equivocation. So it's recommended. So then it happens, and you can have an argument about it, but there it sits. So then it's to me incredibly important that in our surveillance systems we try and then understand um, that it doesn't sort of like um, water down or help confuse our understanding of, of who's getting that testing and um, whether there's specific groups that we can then look at in terms of really trying to sharpen up our focus. So what we're trying to do with Atlas, sorry, access, I beg your pardon. And, and though we, the reason I say it is because we're literally having a discussion with the Atlas team the other day about then providing that algorithm on to them is Anna and team are developing up an algorithm to pick up who are pregnant women and so that then we can say this is likely that this test occurred within the suite of um, that circumstance and what's the proportion positive there as opposed to women being tested outside of that. But Anna might like to speak to it and then James. But the idea is that we will develop the algorithm and then it'll be available and modified appropriately for ATLAS as well as ACCESS. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, to be to be specifically, so where we're seeing it in access is what we call primary care clinics. Now, these clinics, as I said, have these specialist services that we think represent a sentinel surveillance site for our priority populations. However, some of these clinics, it's not all of them, are large clinics. They offer general health services. So they are providing um, routine general health care, which clearly, as we're starting to see on our data, is antenatal care as well. 
I think it's important though to think about we don't we don't want to dismiss women as either having antenatal hepatitis C care or risk-based hepatitis C care. There's an intersection and part of the work we will do will make sure we don't miss out that intersection as well. So we really understand what is happening among women, where are they accessing care and what are the opportunities to provide them hepatitis C care as well. Thanks Anna. James, did you want to make a comment about um, the role that antenatal care testing is playing within the Atlas network? Uh, not really. Just to add to further to Margaret, the better off we have precision uh, data, the better off we will be um, to try and pick up uh, these priority population. It's early days yet in the Atlas network, but um, we're working closely with the Access Network. So hopefully in future years, we'll be able to present uh, much more um, uh, refined data around this population. Now, I'm mindful of time um, and with only a few minutes left. I probably do want to wrap up the Q&A session. Um, so I'd firstly like to thank all the panelists um, and everyone who did pose a question. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get through all of them, um, but feel free to send both Mark or Anna any emails. You've got their contact details and I'm going to hand back to Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, again, my thank you is really, first of all, to, to all of the people, the groups that worked hard to contribute data to the report. The report is nothing without um, you all being generous enough to provide that for us then to be able to compile it. But also a thank you to all of the affected community because that's where the data comes from. This belongs to the people who are at greatest risk of hepatitis C. And I think it's really important that we remember that and we keep on, with as part of our focus, keep on thinking that the people, you know, what we're trying to do, we're trying to eliminate hepatitis C as a goal, but thinking about the individuals who are impacted on by hepatitis C uh, and how we can be providing care, appropriate care to them um, to reduce the impact of hepatitis C on their lives, but all of the other things around which, uh, you know, the circumstances where that they're put at risk. And as, as uh, Carrie highlighted, we're at the stigma, a number of us were at the stigma conference yesterday. And I guess I just wanted to highlight that in Australia, if we had proper drug law reform. Um, so many people who are impacted on by hepatitis C would not be because we would not have the kind of stigma, we would not have the uh, problems with uh, an illegal activity um, that makes people um, use drugs in a way that um, make, puts them at, at risk of getting bloodborne viruses. We would not have issues with drug overdose. We would just get rid of so many things if we really carefully thought through drug law reform. And it is, it's so very possible. So I just wanted to say say that. And as well, it would remove that stigma related to our prison. Like, you know, the, the fact that we have, I think it's a great national shame that we have a great tri prison treatment program, which I really think is fantastic. But the fact is that we have that is because we have massive over-representation of, of people who use drugs, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in prisons. It should be, it's 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 a, it's an, a national shame. So, so to me, I want to sort of thank people for hanging in there, uh, as as the vast majority of us uh, are not impacted on. But that we have to keep on working for that law reform. I think it's probably something we have to all as a group keep on thinking about. So that's sort of my broad statement. As we try and achieve hepatitis C elimination, let's not forget that the reasons why we're having to do this is because of laws that shouldn't exist. Um, I want to though thank again. As I said, um, Anna and Mark for all the hard work. I want to thank the panel and all of the groups that contributed. And I want to thank everybody who came and joined this. It was, uh, when I was sort of looking at it, we over 150 people were online to listen today. I hope this report is helpful to you as you pursue your work. We've got another eight years to reach those 2020, 2030 targets. And I think we could do it beforehand if we all keep on working really hard together, collaborating well. And as I said, focusing on the job we're doing, but also focusing on that other job of removing the stigma, the inequity, and all of those issues around injecting drug use, around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, I think we can go a lot further. So um, let's keep um, trying to keep up our enthusiasm to do that job. And I thank everybody who joined us today.